welcome everyone uh, to this uh, first parallel session in the uh, which room are we in? Uh, Lawson, no. In the Lawson room. Oh, that's got oh, great. Her, her fantastic, her fantastic book on the bulletin. Yeah, uh, in the Lawson room. Uh, my name's Robert Fiddy, and I'm from Flinders University, and I have the privilege of speaking to you here T today. I'm speaking from Garner Land, in the Adelaide Plains, although I'm slightly up in the hills, towards Narrangeri Land. Um, and I had the privilege of introducing Professor Matthew Ricketson, uh, who's Professor of Communication at Deakin University. Uh, he's a sometime journalist at The Age, The Australian Time, various places. Uh, he's, he's a, he's, he, I won't go through the, the biography he's given you. You're obviously welcome to read that. But, uh, he's a CI, CI on the New Beats project, which has been a very significant one for looking at where things are. I'm a little bit interested that he's a descendant of Staniforth, Staniforth Rickardson, one of the eminence grease behind the, the first version of the United Australia Party. <laughs> But um, he's really, he's talking to us today about his work on long form journalism uh, and narrative nonfiction. Uh, so he's been working on this at least since he published Telling True Stories in 2014. And he first started talking about the quarterly essays, uh, essay in 2016. So today he's talking about the first two decades of this interesting, interesting long form publishing venture in Australian journalism. So welcome, Matthew. Thanks very much for that introduction, Rob, um, and for the uh, no doubt unintended slur on my uh, grandparentage. But yes, my grandfather was involved in the first United Australia Party. I'm, that's a long and interesting story, but uh, the connection with the current iteration of the, of the United Australian Party is, is um, galling to say the least. Um, anyway, I won't, I won't spam everyone with stuff about um, Craig Kelly and, and uh, Clive Palmer, even though that's exactly what they've been doing to us. I would like to say, first of all, that I'm coming to you from the, um, and I want to acknowledge the lands that I'm coming from, uh, the Bunurong and Wurundjeri Wairarong peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nation. They're the traditional owners and custodians of the land that I'm on. And I want to pay their, my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, in uh, yes, and that I'm in suburban Melbourne in McKinnon um, on that land. So uh, with that, what I um, this is a work in progress. Uh, I'm, I've been doing some work on not only long form journalism for quite some time, but on the quarterly essay. And what I have particularly been interested in and noticed is uh, it, it's I've. <laughs> The title says it's unique. I think it's unique. Um, and until I can find otherwise, I'm going to keep saying it's unique. I'm going on the front foot in that context. Um, so uh, in this country, there's been a long history of what you might call little magazines and independent news media. Indeed, um, you know, uh, our host for this session, Robert Fidian, is going to be talking about one of them in the next session, Smith's Weekly. Uh, they're not all the same, obviously, um, and, and, but on the one hand, we've got um, Meantian Quarterly, which is, which is a long-standing, uh, going back to 1940, when Clem Christensen set it up um, in Queensland, uh, a quarterly of essays, letters, reviews, poems, uh, debate, and so on. That's still alive today um, under the editorship of, of uh, Jonathan Green. Um, that's that's one kind of quarterly. It's it's it, it's in a tradition of little magazines that exist here and in many other countries. Um, uh, on the right, the picture is of the Nation, which indeed that particular collection of the Nation was edited by Ken Inglis, the uh, who of course the the annual or sorry biannual lecture is um, in in honour of, and this is an excellent collection of. Of the of a fortnightly news, newspaper, which came out from the late fifties um, until the early nineteen seventies, and was was the first, well not the first no because of course there is Smith's Weekly and there's others but one of the first that that started to, if you like, add to and 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 
question the the way in which mainstream daily newspapers were covering the nation, it, it and, and indeed the states and the local and the regional. Uh, so that was one. Tom Fitzgerald pictured there, um, who had been the business editor of the or the editor of the business section of the Sydney Morning Herald, you know, was involved in set, in setting this up precisely because of the, in his eyes, the strictures of working in daily journalism. So um, there's been there's been a long history of these ventures. Um, Mianjin Quarterly is is rare for for being for its longevity as well as many other qualities. Uh, but the the nation is one of many that lasted for um, a relatively short period of time, 14 years for that one. But there's um, Smith's Weekly, which we're, we're going to hear about later, which was a bit over 30 years. Um, uh, the National Times, a weekly newspaper, which ran for about 15 years. Nation Review, the so-called ferret, uh, for about 10 or 11 years in the 70s. The Independent Monthly, run by Max Such, uh, ex-Fairfax editorial director for a few years from the late 1980s. Two versions of the I, the first by Brian Tui, another Fairfax alumnus uh, from 87 to 91. Uh, Eric Beecher, another Fairfax alumnus, set up the I, which was a glossier magazine in about 2000, and it lasted not very long at all. And then you've got Australian Society, which morphed into modern times, and that's it. that was edited by uh, a number of people. I'm pretty sure Peter Temple, the crime novelist, was the first editor, but certainly was involved. And then was taken over by Peter Brown and Stephanie Bunbury, among others. Um, that lasted less than a decade. And Peter Brown um, uh, continues on editing this Inside Story, which is a, a weekly or so online um, publication of a, of a kind that is similar to some of these other ones. So against that backdrop of, of outlets which, which uh, try and provide something other than what's in the mainstream media, uh, print, radio, TV or online, um, you've got a, lot of, got a lot of activity, a lot of them uh, produce some excellent material and really interesting and engaging material, but they tend to last you know, for about a decade or so. And there's all sorts of reasons to do with that, one of which is to do with economics. Um, you know, we are a, a country physically the size of the United States, but with about a 15th of the population. So the economics in terms of this being, these being not mass market publications, but more niche publications has been hard to sustain. So that's, that's the backdrop, if you like, to the setting up of the quarterly essay in uh, 2001. Um, the, the founder is uh, Maurice Schwartz, pictured there on the right. Um, and on the left is Robert Mann, who is the both the author of the first issue of the quarterly essay, um, which you can see pictured there, and, and the author of several others and, and a kind of black ink, which is Maurice Schwartz's publishing house. He's a, he's a regular uh, has a lot of his work has been published there. He, he was a important figure in it from for many years. Um, now, okay, so uh, this is what I, I interviewed Maurice Schwartz um, not so long ago, and this is what he had to say. The interesting thing here in 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 this particular um, quote from him is that the idea for it um, once 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 he set on it, it was pretty much set and um, emerged fully formed is, is what he says. Uh, and that's true. If you look, if you look at it, the, it, it looks pretty much the same as it did 20 years ago. It hasn't had, you know, um, in, in news organizations, the, the kind of annual uh, graphic or typeface, you know, makeover happens very regularly. That has not happened with the quarterly essay. Um, it, it looks pretty much the same. Uh, the context in which he did it, though, it, which he explained to me is, is that it was at a time when um, American publishers were entering the Australian market and this country had previously been dominated by English publishers. And we don't need to go into all the history of that, even though it's both important and interesting. But what the, the kind of idea that, that, that Schwartz hit upon as a small publisher himself was that um, he could, if he could, by, by setting up the quarterly essay, what he could do was attract 
uh, quite high profile, well-known writers to write these essays. Uh, and, and that would not cut across their publishing kind of commitments and contracts with, with um, larger mainstream publishers who were publishing their books. So, so it actually worked for both parties in the sense that he got, he got the use of a, you know, a well-known, generally well-known high profile writer who could produce the quarterly essay um, and that, that would not cut across the, the mainstream publishers, that is not book, sorry, not newspaper, but book publishers, um, and in fact would enhance their reputations and therefore that would be of, um, of value to the publishers. So that's, that, that's one of the pieces of context or background which, which makes it work in a kind of, um, in a literal sense, but also in a uh, commercial sense, because as, as I've alluded to earlier, the, the, the business of this, making it work, um, is actually uh, is a significant problem. Um, and by dint of the fact that it's been going for 20 years, uh, there's two possibilities. One is it either is commercially successful in its own right, uh, or well, there's three possibilities, actually. The, the second is it's not, but Maurice Schwartz, who many of you would know, is a um, he's either a, a, a property developer by day and a publisher by night or vice versa, or maybe does both. But he is a significant property developer and has been for a long time. So he's independently wealthy. And the extent to which his, um, you know, his, his revenue from that part of his business underwrites his publishing is not fully known. Um, some industry sources I've spoken to say that it, it, the quarterly essays don't make a lot of money. Uh, Maurice Schwartz told me that it does. Uh, I, don't, I haven't got to the bottom of that, but in a sense, it doesn't. It matters less than the fact that it's still going 20 years later. And if you look at a couple of other entrepreneurial figures who've stepped in to support mainstream media, and I'm thinking here of people like Graham Wood, um, the founder of a um, online internet uh, travel agency who stepped in to support um, the Global Mail Online and then some money into the Guardian Australia. Uh, Global Mail Online did not succeed. It didn't last. Um, you probably don't even remember it, but it had there were high hopes and it didn't last. And um, and ditto the uh, the the money into the Guardian Australia has been replaced by different uh, different support levels levels and kinds of support. So um, Chris Fike is the is the editor. Um, now and has been since issue 13, he, he starts with that question that is there uh, because these, these essays need to be commissioned up to a year in advance. And so, so, they, so there's a kind of, if you like, a long form news judgment that's involved. It's, there's kind of what people in the media industry talk about news judgment of the day, but this is a longer news judgment. And, uh, and that, that is a bit of an art in itself. Uh, and I've, I've just pictured there um, uh, just some representative issues of the quarterly essay. Okay, quickly in the, I'm thinking about time here, quickly in the context of what has been happening elsewhere in the, elsewhere in the media, you can see lots of job losses in the mainstream media. As we know, um, the figures on the left are for the age on a Saturday, that is the biggest, sell, uh, biggest selling and biggest in size newspaper and how it climbed between 1956 and up to 2000 and, um, and and then you can see declining after the mid 1990s when it reached a peak of 250 pages regularly on a weekend it's now the 2021 figure is for last weekend so there's a lot of turmoil and a lot of shrinking going on in the mainstream media that's the kind of key message there so here are some key components of the quarterly essay uh, a couple I've already alluded to. The, um, the third one, it's about telling stories and talking about ideas. That was what Schwartz said, that um, Fike reiterated that. Uh, not written by a serving politician, um, uh, not written by a policy wonk. And, and both of them talked about how it's a difficult form to do because you've got to, you've got to focus and you've got to distill a lot of material and you've got to keep things moving Whereas even in a book, sometimes there are some chapters which can, can if you like, you know, head off into a tributary of a river and discuss something in detail that is not essential to the narrative. Um, the last point about the correspondence, I think, is really important. 
Um, my colleague Sue Joseph did a very good paper for, oh, sorry, a very good article for Text, the journal, about the 50th issue of Quarterly Essay, which I would recommend to you. It's the one about Julia Gillard, um, written by Anna Goldsworthy. And the response to that is really quite instructive, not in a great way, but I have read just recently the, the most recent correspondence and um, civil informed and robust is how I would describe it but in a way that you, you don't tend to get, certainly in the online trolleries that we see, but also in the, in the daily papers, um, there's not as much of that kind of, uh, you might get civil and you might get robust, but you tend not to get really well informed responses. And so what you do get, and the, the most recent issue responding to George Megalogenes's uh, quarterly essay, is exactly that really informed uh, responses to what he was saying, which 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 add to and, and expand the debate. So um, so this is this is the kind of this point uh, I think is key, which is that uh, you know this is a form that's longer than most journalism, but it's shorter than most books. It has more depth than most journalism, but it's more easily digested than most books. I mean, you can couple of commutes in the pre-COVID days after a couple of commutes and you would have read the quarterly essay. Um, and the happy result is that it means that the quarterly essay can intervene meaningfully in the news agenda of the moment because it has weight and that the people who read it can also take part in that debate because they will have read it because it can be read fairly quickly. Um, only the most diligent can read quickly three and 400 and 500 page books. Uh, so I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to keep moving. Just wanted, um, I'm trying to kind of, if you like, delineate a few of the, the, the elements and what, what, how they make an impact. And one, I think, looking historically back over the last 20 years, uh, some quarterly essays have made a significant of intervention in a key moment in the nation's history. I'm, I mean, I think Rob Mann's first essay is an example of that. Um, David Marr on Kevin Rudd. Uh, the timing was was very fortuitously good there, um, but uh, the second one is they've called attention to a very important issue. The the Robert Mann on Rupert Murdoch's The Australian was still a significant essay ten or eleven years later, and Karen Hitchcock is another example bringing our attention to the problems of uh, the caring for the elderly. This was in about two thousand and fifteen, um, I think, before the Royal Commission on um, the aged care system, uh, informed by Harriet Karen Hitchcock's experience as a medical practitioner. Um, the third one there, Margaret Simons wrote about Mark Latham. This, this is now, now an historical curiosity or oddity, but she, she told us about Mark Latham's kind of intellectual history. And at that time, when both the press gallery was by and large ignoring it, and before he turned went on his particularly florid path since, was actually really useful and important. And ditto Judith Brett on John, the decline of John Howard's government, uh, which she picked up on the kind of trend there well before most people in the Canberra Press Gallery. And finally, the um, uh, in terms of a, an element, um, Laura Tingle's recent essay on what we can learn from New Zealand and Benjamin Law on, on moral panics and gender, uh, an excellent essay about the whole same Safe, safe schools issue. So um, just a couple of things to finish up with in terms of a, the important element here is that there's a list of up to about 10,000 subscribers uh, who buy, who get the quarterly essay every quarter. Um, that builds a solid bedrock of financial support. It then is then sells into both news agents and into bookshops, which, which helps. And um, depending on the issue, they can get up to 25,000 copies in total being sold. And finally, there's a number of awards that various individual essays have won, including five Walkley Awards recently. So I might come back to this in the, in the <laughs> I might come back to this too. What do I mean? Yeah, because I'm running out of time. I'll just leave that there on the screen as a, just to intrigue you. Um, and I, can, I might come back to the previous slide too, depending on how and where questions go. But I think I might leave it there, Robert, so we can, give people opportunity to ask questions, um, discuss, et cetera. Well, thank you very much, um, Matt. 
so if people have any questions, um, I, I think I prefer people to unmute themselves and actually ask them in this environment. That would be my, that, that would be my, my preference. Um, but obviously, I will, we can also have questions through the chat if you, if, if, if you prefer. Has anyone wish to attract my attention? Well, you better tell us about the photo, Matthew. <laughs> okay. Um, this is a picture of Hayden Button Senior, a uh, prince of a footballer for Fitzroy in the 1930s. And I, I put it to Chris Fike that uh, because Maurice Schwartz has made a number of efforts to see if he can get the quarterly essay extended overseas and picked up overseas, so far unsuccessful. And so I said to him, um, does this mean it's like Australian rules football, the, the greatest game on, on earth, but only played in one country? <laughs> <laughs> nice analogy. What, what do you think is the future of the quarterly essay? Uh, as far as I can see, it's, it's, it's humming along. Like a, um, there's no sign that it's not going to continue. Um, as I said, I don't know the exact ins and outs of the finances, so I don't know to what extent uh, Maurice Schwartz uh, underpins it. But as I said, in a sense, it's less material in that he continues to do so. And he has, alluding back to this, the previous slide, um, which is of a, of a cover of the monthly magazine and the Saturday paper, both of which come out of his, out of Schwartz Media. Um, he's, he's proven himself now over 20 years to be, I, I think, a kind of master of a counterintuitive move. He set up this one, which is, if, if not unique, then rare. Then he sets up another magazine in 2005, the monthly, when as we've seen from history, those tend not to last and it's now been going 15 years. And I was checking its audited sales and they're over 31,000 uh, a couple of years ago. And it's, you know, uh, I, you wouldn't want to look at the financial review on a Monday to Friday because I don't think it'd be much more than that. And uh, the Saturday paper, when everyone said print was dead, he set up a print newspaper, um, print first, online second, and it's still going eight years later. And he tells me it's it's um, it's successful as well mm. financially. So yeah, he finds it's a, a good, niche. It's a good news story in a way. Yeah, yeah, he does seem to find a niche, doesn't he? Or have mm. the, the guts to try it out at least. Matthew, do you have any observations on the extent to which that niche has been opened up in practice by the um, movement of the Australian uh, the the Australian further, further and further right over my now interrupted long, that long reading career of that paper? Yeah, good, good question. Uh, look, I think, I think there's an element of that, um, but it, it predates that in the sense that the first quarterly essay is 2001, obviously, yeah. and Chris Mitchell only became editor-in-chief of The Australian in 2003, I think. That's right. Um, and... Uh, and midway through is when there's that famous, not only famous essay from Robert Mann, but equally famous response from the Australian kind of mm. probably as many words printed in the newspapers were printed in the, in the quarterly essay saying it was the worst essay that had ever been written. Um, uh, and, and the real kind of hyper-partisan trend in the media, I think has happened, certainly was beginning early in the 2000s, but it's really accelerated in the last decade. Um, and it's, it's unfortunate because it means there's less, less of people talking to each other across um, their political and, you know, divides and so on. I don't, I don't, that certainly doesn't seem to be helpful. So, so my observation might be truer of the Saturday paper than of the quarterly essay in practice. Yeah, probably. Um, the and the Saturday, the Saturday paper is um, me the least, uh, the least successful in an editorial sense, but I'm not sure that it's actually talking to me, I think it's talking to a different audience. Um, uh, but I, yeah, that, that's just my view. But, yes, anyway, yeah. yeah no, was, we got, I, I can keep asking questions, but I'd much rather they came from the audience. Who, who, anyone else got an opinion, a question, observation? Matthew, can I make an observation? Mark, sure. Sure. Um, what I find, a little bit awkward these days is that I have to buy the quarterly essay at my bookshop, but not at the news agent. News yep. agents have shrunk. That's the true, they have, yeah. So why is that difficult? Oh, sorry, awkward. Well, awkward because there's 
where I live, there's only about one or two bookshops in the whole town. Okay. Um, yeah, and fair enough. news agents have sort of dwindled the way. And the Saturday papers, seems it, the Schwartz distribution seems a bit problematic for them. And, yeah, that's that's definitely true. They they um I have, I have a similar problem. That's definitely something they could work on. Yeah, um, and, and it's also I think probably telling that um, sometimes quarterly essays are reviewed in the literary pages. And you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? I, th I think it's probably a good thing, but it's probably playing to the audience. I mean, it would be great to get it out through that news agent distribution to a sort of mm. make it. But I accept the fact now that news agents, magazines seem to be um, the, the particular one I go to in Geelong West went from a quite a big store to a very small shop, which mainly seems to sell knickknacks and Tats Lotto tickets now. And, yeah. and the, the term, even the term news agent is a bit misleading these days. So. Yes. Yeah, I think, I think the, the, the buying into both news agents and bookshops was something that was done uh, much more fully early on. But I think that trend is changing, as you've noticed in recent years, as, as news agents have kind of diminished in, in both scale and stature. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? I'd also like to ask about the scope of the essays. Um, you mentioned briefly uh, Judith Brett's essay uh, mm. on the fall of John Howard, which I have quoted many times, because she makes the proposition that when the chaser team infiltrated the APEC parade, um, John Howard, John Howard's image as a strong leader uh, of, so it was punctured. Uh, and I like that because I work on satire, obviously, I like that. Mm. Uh, it's also convenient that I can quote that because if I were to say that in an academic environment on my own, the problems of the problems of verifying it would be more or less insurmountable. And I suspect that would have been the case for Judith if she had been writing in the political science journal as well. So there's something that the, there, there is something genuinely essayistic about the way you can try on try on properly informed uh, ideas there, uh, which I which I think is a good thing. Uh, and something we could afford to have more of in academic life as well. Yeah, I, look, I think it's it's definitely expanded that space, and that um, it's deliberately not meant as academic. Um, but it, some of the some of the best essays have been written by academics as well as by journalists and other writers, uh, and they they are they have both time and the space to get into an issue um, beyond what you can do as a daily journalist. Uh, even back 20 years ago and now it's very hard to get time to to really you know build a build a piece over time well thank you very much if there's a last question we can take it um there's something here there's yeah. something in the chat yeah. so, 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 someone's whacking on their keyboard with someone 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 i muted is back i reckon that might even be josh actually <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry, Josh. Um, no worries. Look, that's been a fa that, that's that's been a, a, a fascinating opening up of issues. Um, it's it, the essay essay when Montaigne invented it meant meant attempt having a go at something, and it seems to me that the quarterly essay does have that provision. Importantly, have that provisional uh, trying a set of ideas and observations on and seeing how they work. Um, element, uh, and I look forward to seeing seeing more on more on this topic from you. So thank you very much, Matthew. I'm My sure pleasure. Thank you very much.